Hi and welcome to episode 114 of the This Is Repertage podcast. My name is Alan Law, I'm the founder of This Repertage and This Repertage family, and I'm photographer too. The podcast is back. After a bit of a break, I'm really excited to be back and chatting to the fab Rafe Abrook. Rafe is one of the UK's best documentary wedding photographers and was in our top 100 photographers worldwide on TIR for 2021. I've also had the pleasure to meet him a few times in real life and he's a lovely guy, so fab to have him on the podcast. Stick with us today as Rafe shares all about being an exceedingly tall photographer and how he uses that to his advantage at weddings, the story behind one of his specific reportage awards, giving a bride a fireman's lift and why it's so important to him to immerse himself in his weddings, why he features his second shooters so predominantly on his website, and Netflix synopsis game, why you shouldn't try to be anyone other than yourself, and much more too. A tiny bit from me, um, in case you've been interested in what, what I've personally been up to. Uh, the last time, it's been a couple of months actually. Um, so before I left you, before the, the last episode, I was about to embark on my own wedding photography workshop. Uh, it's called Law School. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't not do that pun. Um, yeah, and that, that was fun as always. I, I really enjoyed doing those. It's up in Birmingham, meeting some really lovely people from all over the UK. And we had um, yeah, a really great day and lovely evening as well. That was really cool. Um, and the next day, I was just walking back to uh, New Street uh, train station. So you probably didn't really not answer at all, but I'm going to say anyway. Yeah, just walking back to the train station. And I just went totally over on my ankle, just on some cobbles, totally over on it, wrecked it. Um, oh man so painful it's still twinging now and it's over two months but then I had a run of weddings my own weddings to shoot as well and it's oh man not fun to shoot weddings on a, a totally sprained ankle um yeah but hey Salabi. um yeah so I've been busy you know lots of my own weddings culling editing like I'm sure loads of you are as well um, I did a family shoot for a past couple as well who I've um I've shot their family for the last few years now as well, so that was really nice. It was this Reportage family's second birthday um, last week or so as well, and we did a little contest on Insta to celebrate that. I can't believe it's been two years already, but yeah, all good with me. Um, I hope you're all well. I hope if you're, you know, in the middle of wedding season and it's going okay, and and I hope if, um, you know, you're, you're shooting all those families uh, day in the life sessions, I hope that's all going well as well um awesome i uh, just before we get on to rafe as well just a little mention that the next award submission deadline is just about a week away so the deadline for that is the 24th of july 2359 bst on the 24th of july and that's the same for both our wedding site and our family site so good luck if you're entering for those right enough of me although you'll hear a little bit of me uh, in the next hour sorry but yeah enough of me doing this intro and over to the man rafe <laughs> Hey, Rafe, how you doing? Hey, Alan, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yes, all good. Thank you. Thank you, all good. Um, enjoying the the warmth. Is it is it nice and hot there with you? It's plenty hot here, buddy. Um, it's uh, I think we've predicted 30 or 31 today, and it's going to be kind of knocking around that temperature for the next week. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a fun couple of weddings coming up. Oh, man, yeah, they're going to be sticky weddings. They will be sticky weddings. You're, so, where, yeah, where are you? You kind of just outside of london an hour or so outside of london is that right yeah that's right yeah in, in a, a market town called hitchin just on the edge of the chilterns it's uh, north hertfordshire um it's a it's, it's a great location actually because um uh i'm sort of surrounded by barn wedding venues here it's um it's not quite the cotswolds but you know <laughs> we've got a, we've got a lot of fairly well-known venues and within an hour's drive of where i live but I can also just whip into London for the occasional big Jewish wedding as well. So it's kind of a great location for sort of just getting around the country in general. That uh, is cool. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot better than my location being stuck in like the bottom <laughs> corner of uh, yeah. The country. Yeah, but you you you've got Polhorn Fort down there, which is epic. Um, oh, that's true. Yeah, you shot there, have you? Yeah. Yeah, a few years ago, it was, it was my first time I ever got a couple down for an actual shoot on a beach, and I was so excited because obviously we're like an hour and a half from the nearest beach, and that beach is South End on Sea, which is not exactly Cornwall. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Yeah. Oh, that's funny, Polhorn. It's funny you mentioned that. That's the venue I've shot at the most. So I don't. I think I've done about I don't know thirty-ish 
weddings there i've done four there this year already actually but Amazing. yeah it's got two of my couples this year i didn't want to go down to the beach at all even though it's that private little beach right there for them didn't want to go down really yeah that is great. why would you book there if you didn't want to use that private beach? i know yeah it's true actually isn't it but yeah yeah fair enough and um but you're saying yeah 30s it's only like 20 23 in cornwall as well which is that's nicer isn't it i think than 30 i think i think i'll take being by the beach with 23 degrees than being in the middle of uh yeah just urban hell in 30 <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah i would say is it's probably worse in london right now but uh yeah That's i mean true. it's a classic classic british thing right we start talking about the weather straight away and yeah. then moan about it when it's really good i mean we could more british could we <laughs> i know it's so true is it it's so true it's so true um and you've got a couple of weddings coming up in this hot period do you have just a random little question on tips do you have any advice or you know about staying cool at weddings i've seen some people talk about these like cold flannel things or something they take with them do you have any specific I, thing i i haven't tried that i mean maybe mm -hmm. take some uh wet wipes i don't know i mean my, my big thing was um uh, my biggest struggle with with this time of year is hay fever uh, and i i get it like super bad and um mm. to be fair it eases off a bit in july um this is not the most thrilling conversation but you're, <laughs> you're committed to this now because you, you sort of led me onto it <laughs> yeah, um, it's good. But, but may june is like the worst like end of may early june i'm in bits and i can take all the stuff over the counter you you, you know that they give you um and i had my busiest spell i think a lot of, lot of people in the industry were saying like may and june was crazy this year and the end of May through the early part of June, I was doing like three a week and it was just mad. And I remember we had a really hot day. I think it was, oh man, I'm trying to remember now. It's all sort of merged into one big blur, but I think it was the last weekend of May, that sort of bank holiday weekend. And it was 33 here. And I remember doing a wedding and just feeling worse than I did when I had COVID from hay fever. Oh, um, and just, yeah, that was the big struggle for me. And I was like, wiping my eyes with these hay fever wipes anything i could buy from a chemist that might help i was kind of <laughs> using um and it's just not cool when you're out directing a couple in golden hour and you're just sneezing constantly <laughs> it's oh just... yeah that really sucks especially with everyone th probably thinking that you have got covid well then, yeah so. because you have covid symptoms right when you have bad hay fever and you're like trying to make excuses and say I I honestly it's not covid it's hay fever <laughs> and you know even though my eyes are bright red and i'm sort of hacking up from tree pollen and oh. also it's uh that so no, really it's, sucks but for me for the heat it's like I, I would always say you know dress don't don't worry about dressing to impress dress for comfort you know you're you, you're there you're there to do a job you've got to do your job to the best of your ability and if you're in gear that is restricting you or making you sweaty and uncomfortable then you know don't worry about it i i literally am baffled when i see and this is not a criticism this is just something personal to me when i see um photographers and videographers you know with dicky bow ties and buttoned up shirts and and, and you know mm. uh, jackets and waistcoats and like how the hell do you do work in that gear even when it's cooler i just find it so restrictive so that's so true i'm mm. like black jeans black polo shirt black trainers just try and not stand out or draw attention but just wear stuff that's comfortable um yeah that's cool you know i i've kind of like been consistent with it so it's like if, if somebody needs a photographer to be suited and booted they're probably not going to book me anyway and i'm kind of cool with that so yeah no, that's all good man and that's really important for people to hear i think as well and, and something we don't actually talk about much on the podcast um is that the the clothing side of it but it's something that people are always interested in i i did start my i it was 11 years ago when i began now and i did start in a full suit but because i thought you know i should do and look smart but that soon went out the window after a few months because it's so restrictive isn't it it's so restrictive yeah. mm. I, I, exactly and I, I look back at my first year and I, i've got photos of myself wearing like um a shirt uh like a tweed jacket because i thought it would make me look creative <laughs> and put, like a hold fast money maker kind of belt um sort of underneath it and i got this stupid jacket flapping around on top and I, and I just remember if i ever needed to like lie on the floor to take a photo it would take me 10 minutes to get up again and <laughs> i just learned very quickly that, that the easiest way for me would just just be flexible and and, and free and easy and i think i just I think Tyler Workin like said to me, just do just get like think tank straps that just sit on your shoulders and don't fall off and just right. keep it real simple. And because I tried everything like, you know, the spider thing and like, all, all the main systems that people used for, you know, their camera attachments and mm -hmm. none of them felt comfortable. And I just went back to just basic straps and it just meant that I could really quickly just put a camera down in like an instant lie flat on the floor and put the camera on a table and all this stuff that you can't do if you've got a buckle attached to the bottom of it. 
Uh, so, yeah. Mm. yeah. So anyway, veering off into other subjects, but no, but that's all good. It's important to fear, <laughs> and that's all really interesting as well. Because again, as well, I think people a lot of the time think they need to buy all these different systems and stuff, and sometimes the very simple things are the best, aren't they? So yeah, mm. well, true. Um, you mentioned about sorry, just you, just before I forget though, you mentioned about like wearing black and stuff, and you mentioned the phrase like not wanting to stand out, but. But so I wanted to ask you about this and you're fine free to ask you about this. But so, yeah, on your TIR bio, you say I'm Rafe, an exceedingly tall documentary wedding photographer based in Hertfordshire. And I've met you a few times. and I know that's no lie. So, for, yeah. So for anyone who hasn't met you, man, how, how tall are you and and how do you use it to your advantage at weddings? Uh, so so I'm in Imperial six. Uh, well, I say six, eight because we all round up. Right. Whether we're <laughs> short, we always have that half. Inch. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> six, seven and two thirds. I'm like 202 wow. centimeters for the for our European comrades. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, I like yeah. I, so I've, I've shot with um, I shot with I, I've met through, you know, the sort of social circuit, you know, a few other guys who are also really t- tall. There's like Adam Lowndes, um, Ben oh, yeah. Minar. Paul Marlborough, they're all kind of, you know, knocking around my height. Um, so I don't know whether I can honestly claim to be the tallest wedding photographer in the UK. Um, but I'm <laughs> well, you're up there. You're up there. I'm, I'm <laughs> going with it. I've not met one taller. So, you know, I can share that title with with anyone. Uh, I know I shot a wedding with Paul once and it freaked everyone out because we're both about 6'8". And it's <laughs> Everyone thought we were brothers, which is hilarious. Oh, that's Paul, I've never Paul, met Paul, actually. Never met he's a great guy. He just looks like the surfer version of me, basically. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, for me, but my height is, you know, whether I want to or not, whether, you know, you can't escape it. And it's something that you have to embrace um, and you have to roll with it and love it. You you know, I'm naturally more edged towards the introvert side of my personality. Um, you know, if I'm in a social situation, I'm, I find it hard. I have to warm up and get comfortable around people. I can't just walk into a room and go, hey, guys, and start high fiving people. Um, but at a wedding, you have no choice but to kind of be that person, I think, if you're going to be semi-successful. And so for me, my height is the icebreaker. It's the conversation starter. It's the thing that people are going to point out and mention. And if I was, as I probably was when I was 15, 16, like super sensitive to it, then it's going to be a barrier and an obstruction. And it's going to prevent you from gelling with people. And as we all know, with the relationship part of this job is absolutely huge. And I say to anyone who i'm you know if i'm training a photographer myself i i i can't overstate enough how important the emotion intelligence side of it is and the relationship building especially if you're trying to um shoot in a documentary way um you've got to get those people to trust you and and warm to you and feel comfortable around you so for me when someone asks me as they do 30 times at a wedding how tall i am (laughs) i absolutely embrace it and i make jokes out of it and i laugh at all the things i've heard a gazillion times to make that person feel good, to make them feel like they were funny and original. So they think, hey, he's all right, you know, and that just, nice. that just gets me on side with everyone. Um, if I got defensive and rolled my eyes and kind of walked off, it just wouldn't be good. <laughs> so yeah. um, I'm absolutely fine with it. I've, I've been in this body for like 47 years now and I've been tall for probably, you know, like 30 of those at least. So it, I've had plenty of time to get used to it. And um, yeah, I put my cape on, you know, as I say, and I become Mr. Comfortable Around People and Extrovert for 11, 12 hours. And then the next day, I just want to sit in a cool, dark room and not be bothered by anyone while I recharge my social battery. And that's kind of how it works for me. And I think to chat to a lot of other people, it's the same thing. Mm. Uh, we're not all extrovert personalities, so we have to flip the switch a bit and then, you know, oh, yeah. bust in a little bit. And then, but then I just need to... I need to balance that by just being left at home for a little while, especially if I'm doing like two or three on the bounce, then the next couple of days I'm like, I don't even want to see my kids and I love them to bits, but I just, <laughs> time on my own i get that though yeah i feel similar after a wedding um yeah it's like it, it is proper like a wedding hangover and not just from a energy sense it's kind of from a, it is from a social sense as well isn't it it is mm. it, it's draining um it's so much more than just you know being in a deep squat hole during speeches for sort of 45 minutes it's uh, the, you know the mental aspect is is really draining and I think we all, you know, those of us that have been, as a lot of us have for the last sort of 12 to 18 months, been under pressure of, of shooting a lot more weddings than we maybe normally would just because of the COVID situation. We've all had to adapt to trying to keep that creative energy for sort of three or four weddings straight. And it is so hard to do. Yeah. You know, body might be good for it, but, you know, that third or fourth wedding to try and keep pushing yourself to come up with 
creative ideas when you know you could just get a safe shot and the client would probably be happy with it. I think that's the real challenge. That is so true. Do you do you like aim to keep yourself like kind of like bodily fit um, throughout the year? You know, do you exercise and stuff? Yeah, I so COVID forced me to become a running bore, and I I'm <laughs> I've I've spent you know like I said uh, thirty years playing basketball competitively and refusing to kind of give it up. Um, uh, so that's my, cool. I read that you recently you represented for Great Britain in your age group. Didn't you? Oh yeah, thanks. You you almost uh, it almost sounds like I'm trying to segue into that, but I, honestly I wasn't. Um, but yeah, no, no, that's I, so cool. I just came back from Spain representing uh, Great Britain in over 45s in the European Championships for wow. bastards, basically. Um, <laughs> it was cool. It was like, uh, honestly, I mean, to put on a Great Britain top, even though it's a, a, a sort of a master's old age group, is like one of the coolest things I've ever done. That's uh, proper awesome. Yeah. How many people have represented their country at anything? You know, well, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and the highlight for me was... Um, our last game, uh, unfortunately, our captain was was injured, and uh, I and I was vice captain. And the coach said, "All right, you're captain today, Rafe." And I was like, "Oh, I hadn't even thought of that." And I was captain against Germany, and I'm like, "It was yeah. a bit of a real moment." I was like, "I'm captain in Great Britain against Germany at a sport. This is like this wasn't an expectation in life, but even though it's it's not exactly the World Cup, it's it's something you can tell your kids, and it's oh, it was yeah." that's so cool man that's so cool yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> i was... love that gosh have you been playing basketball then from an early age did you play it as like a teenager and stuff uh so really predictably i got into it because i outgrew football physically i was football um from like eight or nine uh till 15 and then when you get to 15 you have to play with the men um oh, okay. and uh, uh the problem was me i like I was pretty late having my growth spurt. So I was like 15, I think, when I probably started shooting up. And I just ended up being like stick thin and really awkward and lost my coordination. And so a lot of the other kids were like running rings around me and they were a lot physically stronger. And I had then to suddenly start playing football with fully grown men. And it, it just wasn't going to get picked for the team and I lost my confidence. And then my mum was like, why don't you try basketball? And I hated it at first because I'd spent years with like, foot eye coordination and then trying to transition that to hand eye coordination oh yeah that's quite different isn't it yeah that's true. and so but after you know a year i kind of worked out hey actually this isn't so bad and then never looked back and never went back to playing football and just played basketball and um realized that i was fairly agile for my size and um that gave me a bit of an advantage in that i could run and jump quicker than most six eight guys and that just gave me a natural physical advantage over other players and then you know played the thing was growing up in the isle of wight is like the most rural of rural places in England, um, probably similar to Cornwall. So opportunities to get coached by like top coaches just didn't exist there. There was like right. nobody on the other way who was a decent coach. So I had to learn from watching the NBA. Oh, okay. So, like, trying to be Michael Jordan <laughs> um, without actually having any basic grassroots coaching. So it was, so I was a bit of a raw kind of prospect when I got to university and then I stayed on the mainland as we call it um, <laughs> and then never went back. And then I was just a bit of a late, I was my, development curve was a bit behind everyone else so i think consequently that's probably why i played so late into my sort of 40s is because i was pretty rubbish till i was 30 uh, <laughs> so, okay <laughs> oh, that's all really interesting though yeah. it was cool i didn't know you grew up on the isle of wight as well that's that must have been pretty cool it must be nice i've only been there once but it's a lovely place yeah yeah everyone's a sort of everyone's been there once i mean yeah <laughs> anybody who hasn't been there and been to the needles and carisbrook castle and black gang china and all those places but yeah when you grow up there you take it for granted because at the weekend you just go hey let's go black gang china let's go to the needles you know and it's just part of everyday life but it's everyone else's you know holiday it's destination holiday. Mm, that's so, true. but yeah like cool. Cornwall in that way but yeah and yeah. you know i know i know a few i know a few uh wedding photographers that live there as well um and and you know they they uh, the thing is with the Isle of Wight, I guess it's probably similar to Cornwall in that the average population there has a fairly low income. I mean, it's um, you right. don't realise people that come down to Cornwall and stay in these beautiful little cottages don't probably realise that the actual, you know, that the local population there, the standard of living is pretty low. Yeah. It's the same with the Isle of Wight. So your average client is probably not um going to be you know if you're looking at sort of booking around sort of 2k plus there aren't many people on the isle of wight that have got that budget so a lot of the isle of wight people i know travel all over the uk and just go back to the isle of wight for their home and i'm sure it's probably similar for yourself all uh, right yeah it's yeah local. that is true yeah very true yeah. it is have you ever got have you gone back to isle of wight have you shot a wedding there 
Yeah, I did a couple. I've not been there for a few years, but the couple that I did there were high school friends who'd seen through Facebook. I was a wedding photographer and, and kind of brought me back down. Um, oh, that's cool. A couple, a couple of cool venues there. Osborne House was pretty pretty cool. That's um, obviously one of Queen Victoria's holiday homes. So that yeah, was right. Right. fun. So yeah, there's, there, is some, there are some good venues there. I think um, Benedict Cumberbatch got married in the Isle of Wight. I'm oh really? Sure. He didn't do that wedding though. Yeah. He didn't do. He didn't his. do that one. I was a bit gutted about that. I got yeah, got, got palmed <laughs> off for that one. But, uh, fun. Yeah. Have you on that question? Have you ever shot a kind of celebrity wedding or or, or photographed any celebrities at other weddings or anything? No, no. The the closest I had this year was one at South Farm, which is probably my most regular venue that I do. Um, I, I tend to uh, doing about eight or nine there this year, which is. Oh, cool. is, is Kind of odd, but South Southampton's probably one of the more known venues around my way. Um, a lot of photographers all over the UK have done it at some point. They have the sort of um, uh, it's, it's a very pretty garden. You've got a couple of barns. They have piglets there that the couple can go in and stroke, and that makes for quite a cool shot. Um, but nice. it's, it's it's a nice all-round venue, and um, I did one there. And the I, I'm not massively into sort of West End. I see the odd show, but um, my fiance knows more about that than I do. Uh, but there was a guy who's like been in West End. I think it was Buddy Holly in the West End. Oh, uh, that's cool. And, and so he's sort of known on the circuit. So it was a very, it was a very West End um, theatrical kind of crowd. So very like elaborately dressed and you know immaculately groomed guys, as you can imagine. And it was it was really fun actually. Um, there was some really interesting folk there. Um, but I was kind of lost to it all. And there was some celebs there that I didn't even pick up on like um, i mean we're not talking a-listers but you know toby anstis was there so and there oh, were, cool. yeah. there was going to be a couple of others invited that couldn't make it for various reasons so that was kind of this year but i have one I had one a few years ago that was pretty cool it was up in um the north york moors actually it was uh I'm trying to remember the name of it now god i can't even remember the name of the venue but it was a, it was a really high-end venue up there and if it wasn't for the fact that a general election had been called, Boris Johnson was going to be a guest there, which was oh, right. hilarious. Yeah. Um, but probably would have meant that I probably would have had to have um, handed over copyright for those images, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, imagine, that's that's you imagine, mad. You can imagine Boris crashing around a dance floor after uh, a few yeah. days. Probably yeah, you get some but, great photos. Yeah, I mean, that could have maybe won a couple of awards with those. You never know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny, man. And you mentioned about shooting that South Farm like eight or nine times this year already, did you say? What's... Yeah, I think I've done six already and I got a seventh on Wednesday and I think I'll be doing like nine. I mean, a lot of that is because of the rollover from COVID. Right, um, yeah, yeah. But it, do, it does seem to be the venue that I get the most recommendations from, which is do you, cool. But... Do you like shoot? Yeah, I was going to say, do you you like shooting at the same venue do you have any tips and advice for people who you know who do find themselves shooting at the same venue quite often and you know is it hard keeping it fresh it can be it can be especially if you're there like um as i did recently i think i was there three weekends in a row uh if you get a break if you're like once a month then there's a slightly different look you know different plants are in flower the grounds look slightly different and you can kind of do different things i mean the, the thing with south farm is it, it offers it's a huge amount of grounds and they're all there's a lot of variety there's like two or three lakes and there's kind of caravan gypsy caravans and there's some long grass you can shoot through mm-hmm. so when i go there i try and do something different than the last wedding but you can't reinvent yourself no. like, i've shot at that wet that venue 26 times now it's a bit like yourself with paul horn Ford. Oh, so yeah mm. you do find yourself doing some stuff the same but also you get clients who say we really love that shot you that night shot you did for that couple on the drive so you're thinking right they're going to want that one but it's going to look the same because I've learned over the years how to do it the best. There's no point in me trying to reinvent it and make it worse. Mm, so true. you think, shall I just do this for them and do it the way they want, the way they've seen it? It's just another silhouetted couple with a flash behind, but what the hell? I want to make them happy. Yeah, but yeah. of course, my creative side wants to reinvent it and do it better and do something new. But then you think it might be, you know, that's where I get kind of torn a little bit. I just sometimes think, should I just ultimately make the client happy here and not be selfish and shoot for me maybe i can do something different during the day for me but just for this one i'll just tick the box and make the client happy and Mm -hmm. i think that's something i find myself doing when i'm at the same venue a lot um i love shooting new venues because it's it's selfishly i can then i'd never look at other photographers work before i go to a new venue because i don't want to be influenced by them i want to go see my own stuff and I always say to clients, I'm never going to do a recce on a venue because I'll see very, very quickly where the light is, what I can do. 
um, and I and I want it to be me. It's got to be my work, not just let's go to the bridge and do what every other photographer does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if the bridge has got some cool light around it, we'll do it. But I don't want to go with a, you know, like a Pinterest board of shots that a bride's seen that she likes there. That's like the worst. Oh yeah, thing I for get. Me. I get that. And it's so cool. It's so important to have that confidence, though, in yourself as well, but and not to look at other people's work. But did that come, you know, when you started your career as a photographer? Were you looking more at people's work then? Did that kind of confidence in your own kind of style come later or have you always been like that? Um, I think I've always been quite stubborn. And (laughs) um, maybe from very, very early on, I I realized that um, I I wasn't going to go and plagiarize other photographers work and I wanted it to be me. And... I think that's just been the way it's always been for me to a point. Um, I don't like, I, for one of the things for me, it's pet hate is when a client sort of gives you a list of photos they want. And that doesn't happen very often at all now. And it probably happened more when I was cheaper than, than now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's part of the sort of the sort of migration through transitioning through the stages of being a wedding photographer. That I think you almost have to go to, you know, you have to make mistakes to get better. Mm-hmm. And um, and I just try and manage that relationship with the client now so that in the politest, nicest possible way, if I think they're trying to suggest stuff, I'll just say, you know, I've got a way now I can kind of say, I don't know, leave it to me. It's fine. Well, we'll see what they're on day. I can't guarantee what the light's going to be. I can't guarantee what's going to be in bloom. I can't guarantee when we're going to get a gap after the speeches you know stuff like that and i just say just trust me and everything you've seen that's brought you to booking me has been done this way so i don't need to change it now for your wedding and i think when i sort of explain it like that they're generally okay that's very cool that's cool man so good i think that's gonna be so interesting for people to hear about that as well um so yeah that's that's really cool really cool how did you get into it all anyway by the way is that yeah how did you become a photographer um so uh as i've sort of highlighted i'm i'm not I, I, i'm not you know young um and i and i've been doing this for uh well actually I, f- I shot my first wedding uh 10 years ago a couple of months ago and i know that because i saw that couple at a wedding two days ago and they reminded me and said it was 10 years ago you shot a wedding i went oh my god yeah wow that's cool um and i shot that <laughs> i mean this is this is typically me um i i remember I was shooting like i was just a hobbyist photographer and i was mucking around with olympus cameras then and um I went to shoot this wedding and there was, I was at the local camera club. Um, back then I just, it was just a way of me being able to enter competitions and submit photos for critique. And I just found it was quite a good way of improving. And so there was another guy at the club who had a Canon 5D Mark II. And I think he had a 70 to 200 and a 2470, the kind of default standard Canon zooms that everyone, oh, yeah. kind of, they've got a bit of money. And I was like, dude, would you mind if I, borrow that i got a wedding this weekend and i'd never shot with canon i just I borrowed this camera and i'd never used canon and i shot a wedding with it completely cold wow yeah um and he did color pops and, and you know jaunty <laughs> Ang on grooms walking up a drive and all the all the classic 2011 2012 stuff yeah um, but managed to get through it and you know delivered just enough decent photos that they were over the moon um and and I, it was a sink or swim thing, right? First wedding, you're going to love it or hate it. You sort of think you're a decent photographer, but do you enjoy the pressure? Do you thrive under it or does it consume you? Um, and I loved it. I loved the pressure. Um, I thought, oh my God, this is trust. These people trust me. I've got this power. I've got this control now. It's all on me. And I kind of was like, this is great. <laughs> and I know so many awesome landscape photographers and, you know, wildlife photographers that wouldn't touch, a, a, you know, a wedding with a barge pole. Mm. Um, but for me, it, it kind of was like, I want to do this again. This is amazing. And That's so this cool. was obviously 2012. And um, then I worked a couple more years in my then sort of corporate life. And then that job started to go downhill in terms of um, it was a sort of off the back of the recession okay. and my, my clients were banks and the, my boss was um, I just the relationship with him was sort of going downhill and he was the managing director so there was no further way up for me at that point I couldn't see I was going to progress and I just was totally disillusioned with it and then I thought mm, maybe I could do this for a job and uh, at the time um, and I was married and my my then wife was earning a full-time wage so we kind of did the maths and thought we can pay the bills and survive with one income which we'll probably need to do if I quit and then try and start a wedding photography business from scratch <laughs> yeah. but I did, what I didn't do Alan which most people do is have a rolling start with a portfolio game 
coaching from second shooting and experience from second shooting. So I literally started off the back of, I think, four or five weddings I'd done for friends for sort of 500 quid right? Wow. Uh, on my own, you know, completely untrained. And I think once I decided I was going to do it, I went and did the trained eye, um, like crash course that oh, yeah. four day crash course. I didn't even do the, um, the, um, the development thing over a year. I just went straight in four days of being told what, how to be a wedding photographer, which to be honest, I thought was great. And it was brilliant. And it really did give me a bit of a fast track. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't even know how I managed to convince people to part with their money to book me when my portfolio was literally a handful of images, couples that were posed for me at the trained eye, <laughs> right, yeah. a, a handful of shots from friends' weddings. Um, that well, were, the stuff from your friends' wedding must have been decent, though, to get, you know, to, for people then to book you. It must have been natural. Well, I mean, you, we all look at back at our stuff now and laugh at it, don't we? And I'm very mm. happy to share it with anyone I'm training and say, look at the crap that I was producing you know back back in 2013 2014 but do you not have um, any on your portfolio now on your website from those ways <laughs> uh, no <laughs> <laughs> but, no, uh, no, no. But no i think i think the thing with me was i i was very very quick to keep rotating the stuff i was very i was very um aware of how to curate my uh my feed whether it was my um uh, you know homepage or my instagram feed right. and i would quickly get rid of stuff that was not as good as stuff that I was then improving on. And I threw myself into loads of workshops I did. You know, it kind of coincided with the end of my first full wedding season, which is 2015, was the the, um, the first Nine Dots Gathering. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Probably when I, I guess I probably met you. I, were you at that yeah. first one, Alan? Yes, I was. I was, yep, yep. Um, and that was, I mean, you'll probably remember it well, but it was like, uh, it was like a rock star lineup of wedding photographers, wasn't it? It was like yeah, all, all, all the big men and stuff. Mm. Christmas studios and all that. And so I remember just literally being so starry eyed, walking away from it, going, oh, my God, this is what I want to be like. And then going out and I'll never forget this. I had a wedding a week after the gathering at a really tough, like cheap wedding venue for a mate of mine that I played basketball with. Um, who was it was like, a, I mean, this is this sounds really disrespectful, but it was a really, really cheap wedding. Right. And it was. It was November, like no, late November, on a grey, drizzly day in this like really hard to shoot wedding venue. And I literally went out and I thought, I'm going to be two man. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And I crashed and burned, and I couldn't replicate any of this amazing stuff I'd seen. And I was like really deflated because I looked at it and there's nothing like these. I literally thought you could just go to a workshop, see someone do some awesome stuff, and then replicate it. I had no idea what a process it is to year on year on year gradually improve and you know learn stuff and and i think once i accepted that then i came i I was so much more at peace with myself but i just being an impatient person i thought you could just literally fast track yourself to amazingness straight away and that is just not the case it's such an you know an evolving thing year on year and now i just look at right what's my goal this year what do i want to improve on you know is it my off-camera flash is it my um is it my you know my reportage stuff is it my portraits and i always try and give myself a challenge to say right i'm going to tighten up on this so what workshop do i need to do to do this i remember uh, that's years cool. ago, do you know um gabe mcclintock yeah i've never met him but yes no, he's no. not exactly reportage but i decided <laughs> i wanted to i wanted to polish up my couple shots because i i enjoy doing couple shots even though reportage is my bread and butter you know i oh, do believe mm-hmm. couples should have cool couple shots yeah yeah and, his stuff is like off the wall good. It's like insanely good. But you you spend a couple of days with the guy and you realize that, yeah, he's being booked at wedding venues on the top of the Rocky Mountains. You can't replicate that in Hertfordshire. So no. <laughs> although, he's, although he's unbelievably good at maximizing the opportunity that he's given, his opportunities are unbelievably good. So, But he showed that you could literally walk out into a garden with a few trees and find amazing light and get, pretty awesome shot still in very meager situations so that for me was brilliant because i thought well even if i've got you know limited situations you can still get cool shots out of it so that That's was my cool. that year and I, and I and i think if you if you just try and do it bit by bit rather than try and conquer wedding photography in one go you'll have a lot more success that's really cool that's all such great advice man it's so good honestly it's so good i know you can't see me but i'm just like nodding back here it's really really cool really good stuff really good stuff um let's let's change tack slightly though rafe um let's change yep. tack do rafe do you watch much kind of netflix or movies or other streaming tv stuff 
yeah 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 i, I do and um i uh I, I love watching stuff that's like exquisitely filmed because I think as photographers, we all have that eye. And although I'm not a videographer, I really appreciate amazing videography. Mm. So, I mean, but you've got to have plot, right? So yeah, stuff I love, I mean, I'm still clawing through the last series of Handmaid's Tale with, um, with, with my fiance at the moment. Oh, what's the like first couple of episodes? I couldn't get into it. Maybe I should stick with it more. Uh, it's it's good it is good i mean it is it is harrowing <laughs> it mm. is frightening i mean it's it's not uplifting but the filming of it is is amazing the use of color and, and symmetry is is beyond um but yeah i i can't remember whether i think it may be a slow burn for for me as well but i mean i'm still getting through the last series because i get distracted by other things like yeah. i watch Umbre- i watch umbrella academy on netflix with my kids because it's something they can enjoy and okay. the, the sets, the scenes in in this hotel in this current series, it's like it's amazing. The use of light and color and decor is is beautiful. Oh, that's got again. That's something I've never seen. Is that like a Marvel type series? Uh sort of. It's not mm-hmm. Marvel, but it is. It's sort of vaguely superhero themed, um, but it's a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit quirkier. Um, I think it's really good. It, I think there are three series in now. I think this is the third series, and mm, I should try it. It's, it's good enough that I can enjoy it. My kids are teenagers, like they're like 14 and 15 um, boys. So they love Marvel stuff. And I prefer this to the Marvel stuff because it's a little bit, for me, it's a little bit more artistic, I suppose. And uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it, it's good. But yeah, I'm, there's, that's, there's well, that's good. Like. That's good that you're into it because uh, for the last, I don't know, quite a lot of podcast episodes, I've just been doing a little game uh, where I'm going to um, read out just a synopsis of a series or a okay. movie and we'll see if you can get the title of it. Go on then. Yeah, you're up for it. Okay, Matt. So I've got three ones here. Okay, so this this first one, uh, hopefully people at home are enjoying playing along as well. Um, so yeah, this first one is a movie and it's really old. It's probably, um, I would imagine it must be about 30 years old. Okay, so. On his 21st birthday, African Prince Akeem has to marry a woman he has never seen. Determined to break tradition, he goes to America to look for one he can truly love and respect. Coming to America. Boom. Nice, man. Yes. Straight in. I love that film. You like it? Yeah. And I'm old enough to remember it when it came out as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 30 years old, isn't it? I think it's like, is it like early 90s or? Yeah. Like Do you know what? I reckon it's. I reckon it's more than 30 years old, mate, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I reckon it's about 1990, maybe 89, something like that. Yeah, yeah. probably, isn't it? There's a sequel, isn't it, that released a couple of years ago? I've not watched it, though, yet. Have you seen the sequel? No, no. I tend to... I mean, this is... This is so everyone's telling me the new Top Gun's great, right? It like, is, though, man. It's so good. It's it? so good. Yeah. Is it really? It is really. Honestly, it's, I think it's probably better than the first. I don't know. I love Top Gun That's as well. I- what everyone's saying and i'm thinking i don't want to be disappointed and watch it and think no, uh, all right that's it i'm gonna go and watch it now based on you alan yeah you gotta do it honestly so i i can i can literally say i've never been as excited at the cinema it's it's literally so thrilling it's awesome it's probably cool. okay right done that's it you've sold it to me <laughs> okay but let's do uh, another one uh, so you got one out of one so far it's really good so this one now is a series that kind of came out within the last 12 months okay so Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee's honeymoon sex tape is stolen and leaked to the public. Oh, God, I can't remember the name, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Have you isn't seen any of one, it? Isn't it the one where someone's, someone's cast as a talking penis? Is yes. That yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh, Tommy I Lee. I can't remember the name. Uh, let me think. Let me think. I haven't watched it, you see, but I was aware of it. It's pretty good. Not finished it, but is it's it pretty good? good. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> it's quite All right, listen, I can't remember the name, but I do know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think you do. So it's called it's called Pam and Tommy. It's called Pam. Oh, and that's Tommy. it. Yeah, yeah. But I'll kind of give you that because you did you you mentioned the talking penis, so you knew what it was yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> I've never said that word on the podcast before. But anyway, um, the this last uh, last one now. So the last one. This one is a series. Uh, it's probably about six or seven years old. There have been two seasons of it. Okay. So, a budding teen psychopath and a rebel hungry for adventure embark on a star-crossed road trip in this darkly comic series based on a graphic novel. Ah, oh, six or seven years old. Yeah, it's Bit quite tricky. Series. It was a series, yeah, two seasons. I think it began on 4OD, I think, like Channel 4 series. Uh, Say it one more time for me, buddy. Okay, I will. A budding teen psychopath and a rebel hungry for adventure embark on a star-crossed road trip in this darkly comic series based on a graphic novel. 
Oh, no, you've got me on that one, dude. Sorry. It's got another clue. It's got a swear word in the title of the series. Ooh. <laughs> oh, God, this is... I'm going to know this one. Is I'm going to kick myself. Go on, no, you're going to have to... <laughs> okay, yeah, it's it's the end of the effing world, it's called. Oh, no. Do you know what? I didn't know that one, so I oh. wouldn't get it. Okay. It's so good. Honestly, it's brilliant. It's really, really yeah. good. People, um, yeah, uh, thinking of something to watch them. What's, it, what's it on? What's it on there? Uh, it's, I think it's on Netflix now. I'm pretty sure. I th- right. think it was. That and yeah. top made a note. Okay. Yes. Do it, man. <laughs> but that is good. So that's two out of three. It's really, really good. Well done, Rafe. There is there is no prize, but um, congratulations anyway. So, yeah. That's good. all right. Well, yeah. <laughs> While I mentioned your name just there, it's it, it's quite unusual, isn't it, Rafe? Yeah. So, um, apparently, it's, it's English. Um, it's ye old English, as okay. in 16th century, but it derives from a, a Norse version of the name Ranulf. Oh means herder of the wolves um so there you go yeah when you've got an unusual name you've got to do your homework on it uh, in, case <laughs> yeah, that's true. in case you ever get asked on a podcast um, <laughs> what it means. um do people always pronounce it correctly with rafe or do they no different? i get uh, i get all sorts and my surname as well um is which is abrook but i get abrook a lot which is no big deal um but i i my first name i get people assuming that sometimes it's not english so they think is it rafe oh yeah um which i get quite a lot um or is it ralph or you know <laughs> so i'm like no just say it how it is yeah Rafe, not our Rafe. but i had a i had a couple um bless them who i shot their whole wedding and the entire wedding day even though everyone around them was calling me rafe including my second shooter and the venue coordinator and everyone else they called me raf and um <laughs> the whole I, wedding <laughs> I didn't have the heart to correct them because you know when like you're thinking yeah. right we've gone for like four hours now you called me raf if i say it's actually rafe that's going to make you sound like a dick and i don't yeah. want to do that because it's your wedding day so i'm going to just roll with just roll with it <laughs> um and then the best a very bit, british but, thing that is it's cool. but the best bit was i met them um like uh two months after the wedding or three months after the wedding because uh, they wanted to order an album and they came around and made them a coffee and sat down showed them some books still calling me raf I'm like, okay, uh, again, let's just go. Did you not that. correct them then? No, no. Uh, <laughs> it's gone too long now. It's gone too long. Uh, I think I might have even said, you know, at some point, you know, Rafe Abrook photography, just as a bit of a hint. No, it's still Raf. So there we go. That's funny. That's funny. It's a cool name though. Yeah, like it. Rafe, like it. Mm. Yeah, it's unique. I mean, I don't have any problem getting, you know, my, uh, my... Um, it's a main uh, name. Main name. Yeah, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think anyone else is going to be trying to get that from me either, even though, you know, I get emails from China telling me that's not the case. But, uh, yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Can I have any email address I want? Uh, that is good, man. It's always good. Always good. Um, you mentioned there about your, you mentioned a second shooter, like, you know, calling you your proper name there. And uh, you have a, you have a squad page on your site, which I think is really cool, man. And I was going to ask, are they, are the people on that page, are they like second shooters that you frequently work with or are they associates? You know, how do you do, how is your business run like that? So, yeah, but, but I learned sort of early doors that I'm somebody that likes working as part of a team um, and I like having someone there with me, even even sometimes with weddings I physically possibly could do on my own, you know, when the groom and the bride perhaps in the same venue and you can in theory run between. I, I just find that I like to focus entirely on the bride prep so I don't miss anything, like dad's walking in and gifts being opened. And, you yeah. know, for me... I like my second shooter to be able to focus on the groom prep because again, they could be opening gifts that, you know, guys sometimes are, you know, mucking about and you just don't want to miss those moments. And so for me, and it's more than prep, it's like it's right through the day. So my guys, I know some wedding photographers like say I need groom prep to first dance, but my second shooter stay literally almost until I go. So we can kind of almost tag team on the dance floor. So one of us might just go and grab some water and the other one will keep shooting in case someone starts doing the worm or something. So we don't, Uh, um, but it's become really part of my, my overall look in my galleries and my sneak peeks. Now that, that I use my, I lean on my second shooters quite a lot. I use their stuff a lot. I put their stuff up in my, my Instagram, um, like, you know, um, uh, collages or or reels or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to, use their images um and the guys that i use you know that little squad that i've been working with now for at least all of them for like three years some of them have been with me since like 2015 right wow they've all cool. got their own businesses they're all um they're all you know wedding photographers in their own right some of them do it 
around other day jobs some of them like um you know uh erica uh she does it on her uh, she's got her own business as well um but they're all um people they're all good friends they're all people i trust implicitly but you know for me um you know I've, I've worked with other people outside of that as well but i like the fact that those guys i know 100 percent that they are good people they're never going to say the wrong thing be mm. late you know make a horrendous mistake and i trust them with my clients and all their guests and i think for me to be able to tell my clients you know i'm sending some of my best mates in to work with me here these guys are like no they know exactly how i shoot they know the images i'm going to use and i know that they're lovely lovely people that are going to be um a pleasure to be around and i think that just gives my clients reassurance and when i'm able to put like it's a bit of an odd thing to put a page on your website dedicated to second shooters but that then gives them real reassurance and you know when when they're sort of writing if i get like a google review from them and they'll sort of say oh you know rafe and nikki were awesome or you know rafe and dave were amazing and i just think that's great because they've even mentioned my second shooter which means they're a massive part of the day and they've remembered them and everything And i just think that's nice yeah i, it I think that can be a lonely job and you know mm-hmm. i like to work with people and yeah that's, uh, that's what made I, me think I think that's really cool, man. I think, it, as you say, it, like, it gets rid of that kind of anonymity that um, a lot of people have with second shooters. How they'll just kind of book almost anyone, you know, like a week before the wedding or something. You're proper showing to clients in advance, look, these are the people that I work with. They're people that I trust. And, and you're showing them off on your site as part of that, I think, is uh, adds a lot of trust and, yeah, a lot of value. I think it's a really cool thing. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a massive part of my business, um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm carrying on doing it. Um, ironically, my next two weddings, I'm on my own now, and <laughs> it's, it's unusual for me. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's def- definitely something that I'm going to keep sort of pushing. Um, no, I, I, cool. You know, I, I know a lot of wedding photographers um find it i think difficult to um to elicit any sort of control you know they they want to be the one doing all the detail shots they want to be doing you know the whole thing start to finish so i guess i feel really blessed and lucky that i've got people that i am able to fully trust and lean on because i'll quite happily say you know can you go and photograph the bar while i'm doing the group shots and i won't need feel the need to come in and take some detail shots just in case there's an standard if I say to him, I'll do, can you go and shoot the cake? You know, I won't then go and do my own shots just to make sure. But if I was using someone I'd never shot with before, I'd probably just do everything twice. And, and right. Yeah. And then it makes it redundant, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So that's a big, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Very cool, man. And you mentioned um, Erica there. And you were talking about Erica Hawkins, were you? Yeah, Eric Hawkins. Yeah, yeah. my good buddy. That's cool. And um, a lovely, lovely gal who I've uh, interviewed on the podcast before as well, previously. And I heard that I, you and her are going to be teaming up uh, to be doing a documentary wedding photography workshop. Is that right? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're like really excited to um, sort of pull something together. I've done uh, I've done a couple of my own sort of workshops. I did, did a couple during um, uh, 2020. I think I did one in 2020 and then I did an off-camera flash one in 2021. And uh, we we thought that what would be really cool is th- this is my theory on it. So I, I've been to lots and lots of workshops over the years with photographers and you have to, I think, uh, go and see. Uh, you, you can't just be coached by one person. Um, mm-hmm. I think the best thing you could do, the worst thing you could do if you were second shooting, for example, is to only second shoot for one photographer for a whole season because you're only going to you're only going to see that one person do it and there's no right or wrong with wedding photography there's just different ways different approaches Mm. and so you might pick all that person's faults up um and so with the coaching thing and the through the workshop thing i've seen contrasting styles when i've been coached by you know trainers and i figured that with erica we have some similarities in the way we work uh, but we also do things very differently as well and also i've learned that you know, sometimes, um, uh, you know, the way that I'm going to walk into a bride prep and interact with all those people in there and, and win them over is very different than the way Erica would go in because, um, you know, we're very different people physically, you know. And so for me, it's it's like it's quite hard to walk into a room full of uh, women getting ready when you're, um, you know, this giant, you know, guy with a grey beard who's like, you know, closer in age to the mother of the bride than the bride <laughs> get everyone to relax and feel comfortable with me with my cameras and everything so the way i would go about 
building that relationship and then sort of keep getting a release is probably different than Erica, who could probably walk in and blend in straight away. So there's different ways what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and utilize our own experiences so that if we have half a dozen people um with us you know some of those might be you know 30 year old um you know females some of them might be 45 year old men they're, they're going to get different things from both of us and so we're not going to say this is the only way but this is erica's way this is my way and give them two different perspectives on how we negotiate the muddy waters of a wedding day and try and get the best out of it and also how being a guy of my age and stature, how I can get documentary photos and how I can, you know, be discreet is going to be slightly different than the way Erica does it. So I think people will be getting like double bubble out of that. They'll be getting, you know, they might think actually what Ray said is more relevant to me. And they might think what Erica said is more relevant to me. So it's, mm. it's learning from more than just one person. I and think that that's was really where, good. Mm. But that was where I think, you know, trained eye i did way back in 2014 but again i was exposed to you know four or five different wedding photographers through that and it was great because some of them i thought the way that he is getting that couple to interact and be natural with each other is something i could do but that person that's not my personality i can't be like that and that's one of the things is like it's i think it's one of the scariest things when you're a new wedding photographer is getting couples to pose and look natural Mm. and um sorry i do realize this is slightly irrelevant to the whole theme of this is repertoire no it's not irrelevant because like, the vast um, majority of us still do couple stuff well but, yeah we, we so. still most of us still do that right yeah uh, and that that's that's uh that was the thing for me that i i just felt that if you put all your eggs in one basket then it's you know it, it could, could be quite tricky so j just with us i think what we're doing is we're trying to overall eric and i both love natural and you know unposed stuff and it's the moments between some of that stage stuff that are the, the, the bits that we enjoy the most but we still know you know a couple are going to want some nice couple portraits so that's kind of our overall sort of usp is it is two different photographers that go about things slightly differently but we're going to share our experiences and hopefully it gives people a little bit more than just me saying this is what i do um yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of what we're looking to do. So I think that's really cool, man. Really exciting as well. And you're both brilliant photographers, both lovely people. So, yeah, anyone listening now do. I'm sure it's going to be really, really good, man. Do you know when you're going to be doing it and where? Well, we're, we're about to launch our little, um, our little initial marketing push, but we're looking to do this in the winter um, so we can, you know, get people prepped for 2023. Uh, but one of the things we're going to do is, and I think, think again this is hopefully really added value is rather than it just being a classroom session we're going to have each of our delegates is going to come and actually uh, be like a third a third wheel at a wedding so oh, the, wow, whoever, gosh, yeah. it's like my wedding and erica's second shooting while she's second shooting she will be coaching that person and i'll be you know doing the usual taking on the pressure of the day so i'm, I'm not going to be coaching because i'll be running around you know managing yeah. the plan where everything happens but erica is a second shooter will have the ability to say here's how i'm setting up my flashes for the first dance and as you can see you know this is why race put the couple here because he wants the light behind them not in front of them and that kind of thing that's so, great gosh that's going to add so much value that's going to be awesome well, man that's where the big value of this is i think because that is what people want to pay for you know new wedding photographers they want to get out and get experience and they're mm. not going to they're going to learn how to be a wedding photographer from watching youtube or reading a textbook they've got to go out and experience it and if you've got someone holding their hand through that day i just think that's massively valuable and that's really the the, the crux of it for us very cool man very exciting yeah all the best to you both for that and Thank um you. yeah and obviously i'd be able to help publicize it in tir and stuff as well so yeah that's Thanks. Okay, yeah no worries that's so cool man exciting um let's talk about one of your specific images dude it's um one of your specific reportage awards that i um, i just i really love i wanted to ask you about so it looks to be i think from a ceremony with a couple in the middle of the frame and their heads together and the congregation are all like with their arms and hands like out towards the couple do you know what i mean uh, yeah 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 that was that was wow that was <clears> that's some wedding um yeah tell yeah. us more about that one it's cool so that that wedding was uh um probably the most spiritual wedding i've ever been to and I, i'm not a spiritual person by nature um which my fiance laughs at all the time <laughs> she is a bit more spiritual than me but um i i do i do enjoy being um being, being someone who's like I, I don't have 
a god in my life and i'm i'm atheist but i'm very open and and you know uh, respectful towards all religions um i i find jewish weddings particularly fascinating i i love i love the whole ceremonial piece with them i just think there's another level to them um that i enjoy now this particular wedding was was a, was a baptist uh, wedding um and for me what made it special was that um everyone there was part of this this church it was a real family church kind of vibe right the um pastor because it wasn't a vicar in this case was just so connected to the couple you know and everyone there was just they were just i don't know it was difficult to put in words but spiritual was 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 a word i could use because i could just see this connection this wasn't a couple who were getting married at a church because their parents got married at that church and you know six months before the wedding they started going along to a few services just <laughs> yeah. happy. but they just wanted a church wedding because they thought that's what would make their parents happy this was not that at all this this couple were massively involved with it um the you know everyone that was in the church they had a, a sort of a christian you know wedding band playing in the church and every single person in that in that service was was singing they were kind of you know looking hands up to the sky where they were singing it was a real almost like um a sort of a uh, you know something from uh, an american sort of scene in the deep south you know they're almost like gospely in that kind of way yeah but everyone was was singing with their hands and just so passionately into it um and that particular moment you know we didn't know that was happening but he brought the couple up to the sort of halfway point of the aisle and I sort of just sensed, you know, you know, when you're trying to sort of read minds and you're trying to think, right, well, what's going to happen here? Mm -hmm. And I just had this feeling that I just needed to back right up, back up the aisle and just get a wide view. And then he just got everyone to sort of point their hands towards the couple and yeah, it just kind of unfolded, but it's just instinct, you know, it's one of those things that it wasn't like they told me this was going to happen. Um, but I just, felt like i was naturally moving to a position where i needed to get a wide frame um but yeah it was it was the only time that i've ever seen that in it in yeah a i've never seen anything like that it's so cool it's such a yeah. serene capture um, yeah and it's it's taken quite high up as well is that you like at arm's length up or is uh, that just your normal height is that eye level <laughs> rafe eye level <laughs> it's uh no there were some steps at the back of the church which um which i sort of managed to get up on um so yeah i mean i'm tall but i'm not 15 foot so <laughs> uh yeah i mean but definitely you know i mean I, I, going back to the height thing now um the aside from the the sort of getting engaged with people at a wedding be, being tall is bloody useful i mean people come up to me and say oh, it must be great being tall being a wedding photographer and my my natural response is oh you know you wait till the speeches you're going to see me trying to shrink myself down to three foot nine oh, <laughs> to yeah, not get anyone's true. way and i'm literally on my knees or i'm in a deep squat hold and i'm praying the speeches aren't going to be too long yeah. but the reality yeah. is that and this is more so for i would say jewish weddings than anything else is when that israeli dancing is kicking off and circles are forming um you, i don't know if you know what i mean but you know yeah. you, when you've done a few jewish weddings you know where to be and when not to be and when not to be is in the middle of one of those circles because the guys will start throwing each other around like you know mm. crazy and you don't want to be part of that so for me i can back off and as i feel the circle for me i can just step back step back step back stay as close to it as possible but not get in anyone's way but see over the melee and still get focus on the guys that are spinning each other around in circles that uh, is handy that is handy it, it is yeah and you know <laughs> and, and i'm shooting a live view obviously you know flip the camera screen back and i can sort of see where my focus point's hitting but i can get a real bird's eye view of that and i see my second shooters um you know sometimes so nikki who shoots with me is like five foot one and joe is like i think five three five four and you see them <laughs> literally like really struggling and they they've got to get a completely different vantage point they've almost got to shoot through gaps but i can shoot over them and that is massively useful so that um, is yeah that is a plus that is a plus i've never done a full jewish wedding but i've shot quite a few weddings where they've had jewish bits in them so i know what you mean by that um that ring danger it's dangerous that kind of getting in the middle of that bit as well isn't it it's dangerous. oh mate seriously first first time uh rest park jewish wedding um i was with my mate michael who's now a videographer um that i work with uh then he was second shooting for me and w our instinct was you know i said to him before look dude look get close to the action yeah, yeah go get in by, you know, 24 mil don't be afraid let's put our heads where it hurts we literally put our heads where it hurt in the middle of a circle before you know it 
elbow in the head, camera's yeah. knocked out of our hands. Oh man. You know, foot in the face. And we're like, retreat, retreat. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, you only do that once. <laughs> no, that's funny. That's funny. And I get the whole group photo of all the guests. You don't need – can you just hold the camera up high and get them all? Oh, no. I mean, that, that's <laughs> that's the assumption. That, and I'm like, no, no, I need a first story window. And, yeah. But, yeah, I do I do joke that I don't take step ladder to weddings. But, um, but yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll Sorry. Do, I had to do some I'll of those do. jokes on the on – No, the... no, no. <laughs> that's default. It's like, you know, tour guy jokes 101, isn't it? You've got to yeah. do it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um dude okay this is this has been so good but i've just looked down we're almost at an hour already and um so yeah it's been so good we've got time for just one more question that's okay yeah cool for it Go okay ahead. and it's something um so yeah can you i wanted cool, would do if you could tell us a bit more about that first shot of you on your website's about page and why immersing yourself into weddings is something that's so important to you uh no, that one i mean yeah the me fireman's lifting um a bride that yeah, one yeah yeah it's so cool <laughs> that was my first same-sex wedding and i remember that i was super nervous about it because i was overthinking posing two girls you know just thinking oh, how do i do it i don't want to offend anyone you know you, you, yeah. I, I had this ridiculous view that they were going to be super sensitive to me you know posing them in a more you know typical male female way and i they were absolutely sweethearts and once i had my meeting with them um like six weeks before the wedding i felt so much better because they were like look we just honestly don't worry it's going to be all good and they were an absolute pleasure to photograph they were just so easy going there was so much love at that wedding it was one of my favorite weddings ever uh this was back in 2016 and the both of them got you know paralytically drunk but not in a way they became like obnoxious they were just funny you know and just falling about all over the place and the wedding venue they were at it was a venue where there were two bits to it and there were two weddings happening in two different parts of this this venue it's quite a big venue it was an old um devere hotel kind of thing down in just just north of london and um the other wedding section or part of the venue had fireworks and they decided they would just crash that wedding um and just go and watch the fireworks <laughs> nice. on the assumption that hey well, you know we're two brides who's gonna who's gonna kick us out yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I, i'm just gonna go along and photograph this it'll be fun even though i haven't got a tripod or anything i'm just gonna try and cobble something together yeah and um and somehow one of the brides she just like lost her shoes and we were just walking across some gravel and i just thought it'd be the gentlemanly thing to just give a fireman's lift and my photographer just happened to capture a photo of it and it was just something i thought you know this this just shows that i suppose you know that i really like to get that comfortable with my clients that they willing to let me do that yeah um, we were they they were like bringing me and my second shoot into the group shots they wanted group shots with us oh, which is just cool. surreal and i just thought wow this is this is so good and I, that was one of the things that you know the wedding venue itself wasn't brilliant but the people at the wedding made that wedding and the relationship I had with that, with that couple. And I then put my second same sex wedding off the back of that because one of the girl's cousins, um, got married to a guy uh, the next year. And so I did, that was my first two guys wedding. Okay. And so it just kind of spiraled from there. And, um, yeah, it was, it's it was proper cool. I just love it how it's the first image on your about page as well. I just, it's, you know, most people's is like a kind of like self shot taken in the camera or something or with the camera in their hand or something. And it just shows such a kind of natural human side to you. And like you're a proper, you know, you're a person above a photographer as well, I think, which is really cool. I, I think so. And I, I genuinely, honestly, Alan, had people book me off that photo alone. They said <laughs> one saw that. And also that you had a sense of humor and that you didn't take yourself too seriously. We were like, yeah, this is a guy we want to spend the day with. Um, and yeah, you, all you can be is yourself, right? I mean, that's what I'd say to anyone. Just just let your personality flow in your social media and your website. Be you. Don't try and be what you think your client wants you to be. Just be yourself. I, I say that with some reservation. If I was completely unpegged me i wouldn't get any bookings but, you know, <laughs> why what would you do what would you do mate? <laughs> I, I swear all over my website and, <laughs> and and make inappropriate comments something that my second shoot is no i'm known for well i'll just think <laughs> something funny in the middle of a wedding day and think this is hilarious and my, my mouth and my brain will not engage breaks and i'll say it and then realize as the words are coming out my mouth <laughs> that that was the wrong thing to say even though i'm laughing at myself and that is one of my flaws i don't do it all the time but yeah i i do have to pick my sense of humor back because 
<laughs> it's a little bit dark at times. <laughs> oh, that's all good though, man. That's all good. Um, but that is great advice just to be yourself and not to be what you think your clients want you to be. And that is so integral, isn't it, to what we do? It's so true. It's so true. 100%. 100%. Mm. and man that is so good and people i always say people listening you know check out the reportage ward that um you spoke about and do that head to this reportage.com or this reportage and you'll see it but also i'll include a link obviously to rafe's site and you should check out that photo of him uh, with the the with fireman lift and and the squad page as well i think that's really cool and it shows so much respect as well for your seconds doing that i think it's um, all really cool and dude it's just been so good talking to you i've just loved it no, it's been awesome, mate. And I just wanted to say as well, uh, you know, um, I, I, I'm a massive fan of what you've done with This Is Reportage. Uh, you know, I've been involved now for a few years. I, I personally, you know, there's there's a, there's only a handful of, um, of award things that I, that I put in for, uh, you know, through the course of the year. But if I ever win something through This Is Reportage, that means the most to me. I mean, the standard of stuff coming through now is just next level. And if I ever get anything, oh, honestly, it's like, it's such a boost because the standard of work submitted is just unbelievable. And uh, I think you've done an awesome job building that community. Oh man, thank you. That means that means a, a real lot. Thank you, dude. Thank you for being such a, an integral part of it right from the beginning as well. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Man. No worries. Thank you. And um, hopefully I'll see you again soon. Oh, you mentioned Nine Dots. Are you coming this year? Uh, I can't, I'm not making it this year. Um, I'm, I'm going to be uh, going to Doc Day next year, which I yes, that was fantastic. I yeah, think. we spent quite a bit of time together the last Doc Day. That was really fun. Yeah, no, it was such a good laugh. So I, I knew straight away that I'd, I'd be up for doing that again. Um, so I'm sort of doing sort of one thing a year at the mo. Um, I, I probably will come back and do Nine Dots, but I, I thought I'll do Doc Day again in 23. Um, it also cool. is time of year as well. So um, sorry if I'm promoting something i shouldn't be but oh no they'd be daft yeah yeah no that's that's really exciting that man yeah but uh, oh it's kind of very linked to 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 what you got you you do as well so um, totally a really cool group of people so yeah I'll, i'll i'll be definitely doing that awesome man dude it's been so fun uh talking to you and i will see you um in is it next it's february isn't it then yeah, next it is. yeah it is so um yeah if i don't see you before then mate i look forward to catching you then yes man awesome thanks again dude see you later all right mate bye 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 you've been listening to the 114th episode of the this is reportage podcast always enjoy talking to rafe hope you liked listening in Head to thisisreportage.com for a link to his website and to see the specific reportage award he spoke about too. We now have 114 episodes of the podcast available where we speak to wedding and family photographers from all over the world. If you like this episode, delve into our back catalogue for lots more. If you're not a member of this reportage or this reportage family, check out all the benefits of joining us, including an unlimited number of images on your profile, 60 individual award and 18 story award entries per year, invites to our physical meetups and parties, exclusive discounts, hours of educational videos featuring tips and advice from some of the world's best photographers, and much more too. There's now just over a week left to submit to our next award collections. The deadline is the same for both our wedding site and our family site. Submit by 2359 BST on the 24th of July 2022. No poses, nothing staged, this is reportage. And this is bye for now. 